Aber, okay. Right, I have to speak up. Okay, welcome everyone. We're gathered today to welcome in the new year. I was told that this was a new year meeting. Uh, so my mom said, you wanted me to talk about the new year, but I don't think it was quite so specific. But nonetheless, I'm going to talk about the new year. I talked about this yesterday. It's a talk that I often give. I used to give this talk often in Thailand because the uh, in Thailand for the new year they wish each other, they say it, the word they use is sawaddi. Sawaddi means well, well-being or so on. So they say sawaddi bimai, which means happy new year basically. And uh, in, Cam in Cambodian, it's Swastai. So it's very simple, Swatdi and Swastai. And why, it's inter why this word is interesting is because it's a word that's actually quite familiar to us in the West. Does anyone rec do you recognize the word? Swatdi, Swastai. In the, the proper Sanskrit uh, uh, pronunciation is Swasti. Swasti is, is a Sanskrit word. It means well-being. So it starts to ring some bells. We know where the, swasti, the swastika. The swastika, the word swastika, ika, on the end means that which has or that which, in this case, brings, we would say. So the swastika is the bringer of well-being. It's a charm. It's a symbol that brings flourishment or causes you to flourish. So the sun was the swastika. I mean, the swastika is actually supposed to be a symbol of the sun. So, but it's it's just a symbol that means good things. So it was, of course, co-opted by the Nazis and corrupted, and forever will remain that way in our, in the Western mind. But uh, the word is interesting, and it's pertinent, and it's something that uh, comes up often in Buddhism. So it's appropriate to talk about, especially in the New Year when people are wishing each other Happy New Year, when they're wishing Swasti Be Mai, Swati Be Mai, there's well-being in the New Year. So we often, I often talk about, around this time, about what it means to, what is the meaning of well-being? What does it mean to have well-being? What are the things that bring well-being? So I thought I would adapt it today. There are four things the Buddha said that bring well-being, and I thought I'd adapt it to talk about four meditations for the new year. There are four qualities of meditation. So actually, we're going to try it. This is something new, new for the new year. I've never done this before, but we're going to go through each four of these things together, if you will and we'll do them as a meditation each. So first, a little bit about the meditation that I teach for those of you who are unfamiliar. Um, the first of the four is wisdom, so that's where we're going to start. And I want to explain why that's uh, the first and, and, and the importance of that. Uh, Buddhist meditation, the, the core of Buddhist meditation isn't just for calming the mind or, or as an escape or a, uh, a state of peace or a trance. It's about learning and it's about understanding. Meditating in the, tr in, the, in the Western definition of the word. So we're actually contemplating or you know, more to the point, we're learning, studying. So we're going to practice, we practice to try to learn about ourselves with the understanding that, uh, with the claim that understanding uh, is what leads to, to, to peace, is what leads to true peace. You know, the concept that the truth will set you free, well that's 
a very Buddhist concept. So to that end, the meditation that we practice is not based on some sort of spiritual or mystical or, or uh, far away concept. We meditate actually on ourselves, we, and not, not any spiritual or philosophical sense of self. It's actually you know, us in a mundane sense, our thoughts, our emotions, our bodies, our pains, our, our feelings. We focus on the mundane aspects of our existence that uh, cause us uh, suffering, that we, for the most part we want to get away from, right? And to find happiness, we try our best to get away from the mundane, whether it be through entertainment or possessions or our interactions with other people, uh, vacations, anything to get away from the mundane, the ordinary. Well, this is not the path of Buddhism. And our teaching is to learn and to understand the mundane and to see that actually it's anything but. It's actually quite exciting. And, and so much is going on behind the scenes that we ordinarily take for granted and that we actually miss. So I'd like to start there. The, the, the technique that we use um, what we're trying to do is cultivate an objective state so that we can look at this, we can look at our experience without reacting to it, without judging it, without clinging and, and uh, reacting you know, in general. And so the, the technique that we use to do this is reminding ourselves, reminding yourself that it's just that. When you have pain, remind yourself that it's just pain. Uh, when you have a thought about something that happened in the past or worries about the future, reminding yourself that it's just a thought or a memory or an emotion. When you get anxious, remind yourself it's just anxiety, it's not a problem. and you know, It's not worth getting obsessed and, and, and uh, ballooning out of control. Catching it before you, before you react and... and uh, take it to the next level. So the, the, how we do that, we're reminding ourselves means actually really reminding yourself. When you have pain, reminding yourself this is pain. Or very simply, we use a mantra basically, saying to ourselves, pain, pain, pain. Or if you have a thought that's been bothering you, you say, thinking, thinking, reminding yourself, it's just a thought. If someone's yelling at you and they're calling you all sorts of nasty names or accusing you of this or that, hearing, hearing. I always tell this to children, it's a good way to deal with your parents when they're nagging, just say hearing, hearing. And they laugh, and you laugh, but the, the, what it, the actual result is that they're able to hear objectively what their parents are saying without going the next step of reacting and getting upset. And so they actually are more comfortable uh, receiving the things that their parents say. It actually is effective on both sides. But children, kids like that uh, idea, generally. It does work, though. Uh, your emotions, even. See, emotions are, like, take, take negative emotions, anxiety, fear, depression, and all that. And these are a problem. There's no getting around it. They're intrinsically unpleasant, unwholesome, bad. They're something we could do, wish we could do without. But a moment of having these emotions is actually not, uh, not a, much of an issue at all. If you are anxious, you're only anxious for one moment. The moment of anxiety leads you to get upset in the body, leads you to tension in the stomach, a heart beating fast, maybe a headache and in the shoulders and everywhere. And then uh, you react to that. So you actually get anxious about your anxiety. Oh my gosh, I'm anxious. Oh, oh uh, I can't handle this. And you get more anxious and you, it snowballs. Uh, when you're upset about something, you have the pain and it makes you upset. Well, then you get upset. Oh, this pain is horrible. And you actually feed off your own upset. You react to the reaction and it, this, it grows. A moment of pain isn't a problem. Even a moment of anger isn't a problem. A moment of depression. If you just see it as depression and let it go. 
So this is what we're going to try to do. We're going to use this mantra to remind ourselves. So we'll start with this first concept of wisdom, and I want, this is how I want us to start our meditation. This is how the Buddha said we find well-being. So if I can have everyone get into a comfortable position. If you want to know the traditional meditation position, it's with your legs crossed but not with the heel underneath. So you'd take, that, you'd take, you'd take your left heel out and just touch, just touch the front of the, the, the shin, just like that. Yeah. That's the Burmese way. So, uh, yeah. And of course, if you're sitting up on a chair, you can sit higher if you want. It, you don't have to sit in this way. It's, it's considered a good balanced and a, just a bit of a challenging way because you're going to find that it's probably stretching your legs a bit and it'll eventually lead, you know, eventually you get, better, you get more comfortable with it and your legs go down and she's able to do it. Yeah. Okay. And uh, as for hands, well, we have these old statues that tend to sit with your hands just one on top of the other on your lap, so that's generally how we do it. Some people like to touch their thumbs, but you know, you can also sit them up here or as you like. We're not, we're not concerned about uh, posture or technique or anything like that. We're, we're trying to learn, we're trying to study ourselves. And if you have any experience with life, you know that it's kind of messy, so it's more like a war than a, than a, a classroom. So we're not trying to, th there's no one technique that's going to work. It's going to be, you have to be tricky, it's like guerrilla warfare in a lot of ways. Your mind is going to play tricks on you. Um, so yeah, th don't worry too much about technique or, or, or posture or so on. Worry more about learning and, and trying to understand yourself. So we're going to start by closing your eyes. Everybody close your eyes. And uh, we're, going to we're going to concentrate on this first concept of wisdom. This is the theme for the first part. What do I mean by wisdom? What did the Buddha mean by wisdom? We, we make a lot about the, the fact that wisdom is not the same as intellect. So we, under, we recognize it as a kind of a wisdom to learn something from someone else or from a book. Sure, you can call it wisdom if you read something and then you accept what you've read, read or agree with what you've read or it, it, you come up with a logical argument or you follow someone else's logical argument. That's a kind of a wisdom. But it's not real wisdom or it's not substantial useful, life-changing wisdom. We, can, we, break it into, we break that into two parts. There's when you hear it from someone else, well, that's kind of wisdom that comes from hearing, from learning from others. And then there's another kind of wisdom that comes from thinking. So some people will admit, yes, if you just hear it from someone else, that's not real wisdom. But when you think about it, and you come up with your own logic that supports it, well, that's got to be real wisdom. And so they well, that, that's the kind of wisdom that philosophers talk about and so on. But even still, that's not what we would consider real and useful wisdom. Even that kind of wisdom doesn't change your, isn't life-changing, doesn't change your habits or your way of life. Probably you can guess where we're going. The third type of wisdom, the wisdom that we're looking for, is from experience. It's the kind of wisdom that comes from life experience that people get as they grow, that children are, are, are unable to find for the most part, not having had the experiences that you gain just by living life. Except, you know, age doesn't equal wisdom. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to provide ourselves with the experiences. We're trying to provide ourselves with a uh, framework within which we can gain real experience about how our minds work, how, how life works. We're looking at the very building blocks of existence. And so to do this, we shift from the idea of I and, and body and, and this room that we're sitting in and this idea of three-dimensional space or four-dimensional space-time or whatever, like the idea of a world outside of us as the frame of reference, and we turn to a frame of reference from the personal, from an empirical point of view, from the point of view of experience. 
And to do this, we give you, I'll give you a simple exercise. Some of you have done this with me, but we'll start by taking the breath as our object and just focusing on one simple object and trying to see it and trying to look at the world from a point of view. Look at our experiences. Watch something happen. Very simple. But this is like a basic freshman uh, science experiment. Let's take something very simple and look at it and start to see how the world works. So we're not going to focus on the breath it, directly. We're going to focus on what we experience as a result of breathing. What we experience is an expansion. If, you're, if you have tension, most of us, uh, most people living in the world will have, uh, their bodies will generally be fairly tense and you'll find yourself breathing from the chest. If that's the case, then you'll feel an expansion in the chest. As you start to relax, you'll find yourself breathing from the stomach. And so this is where we want to focus, is on the stomach. In the beginning, it might not be easy to see that. That's fine. We'd like you to focus there anyway, because if you keep up with this meditation, eventually that's where the breath, the, the expansion is going to happen. So if, if it's not obvious to you that your stomach is rising and falling when you breathe, you just put your hand on your stomach. Take one of your hands and place it on your stomach. And breathe naturally. We're not trying to change the breath. We're not trying to create something. We're just trying to learn where in the observation phase. And you should feel that your stomach is rising and falling. So what we want to do is create a objective state of mind, get ourselves into this mode of just observing things as they are. Because our ordinary state isn't good enough. Ordinarily we react to things, we judge things. You may be already judging, wondering what the heck we're doing with this meditation. Or maybe something's happening, maybe you have pain already and that's unpleasant and you're judging, reacting. We have to take our minds out of that reactive reactionary state. So to do this, we use this, this reminder or mantra, if you like. We actually say to ourselves, when the stomach rises, we say to ourselves, rising. And when it falls, we say to ourselves, falling. Rising. Fall. You don't say it out loud. You just in your mind, remind yourself, this is rising, this is falling, so rising, falling. And we're not trying to change or control, we're just trying to watch and see how our body works. And, sneakily, we're going to see how our mind works. Because as we focus on the stomach, we're going to learn how we approach this exercise. It's like a science experiment on yourself, a psychology experiment. As you'll find your mind doing all sorts of crazy things. It will, it will want to control the stomach. It will slip off the stomach and start thinking about something else. It will feel good about it, feel bad about it. You're going to get to see how your, how your mind works when you give it this simple task of watching and, and being objective, rising, rising, falling.
So this is our first theme, the idea of wisdom. Hopefully, just a few minutes, you've started, you've opened the door, maybe for the first time to learning how your mind works. If you've done this before, it's a familiar practice. It's the idea of learning about your body and your mind and becoming familiar with the reality of your experience. Because a lot of our suffering comes from uh, the surprise you know, of change. <coughs> Something breaks and we get upset, but if we'd really been thinking clearly, we'd know that that's inevitable and we'd We wouldn't have set ourselves up for that kind of loss. We know that that's the result of clinging. When you cling to something, you're setting yourself up for, you're making yourself vulnerable to suffering. Your happiness is dependent on that. We learn about the things that we cling to and we see that they're not worth clinging to. We don't gain anything from it. Just learning how, how our mind works, seeing how we cause ourselves suffering, seeing how we blow things out of proportion, how our reactions are really the cause of stress, not the experiences. So pain isn't bad. Thoughts can't be bad thoughts. No matter how horrible the thought may be to you or about you or from you, that's just a thought. Even emotions don't have power over you unless you give it to them. So this is the beginning of the meditation practice, is to look at things in a new way. Stop thinking of, of people, places and things and start looking at the actual experiences what's going on behind the scenes, what's really going on when we interact with the world around us. The second theme is effort. So it's not enough to want to be wise. This is what I was talking about before. Wisdom is a great goal to have, but it doesn't come without some serious work on our behalf. Funny thing is happiness doesn't either. I always think of happiness as what you get when you relax, no? when you laze around, when you take a day off. Happiness doesn't really work that way. For many people, there's, there's, not, there's, no, there's no hope for happiness, especially if they stop working. You know, for many people who, are, who have depression or chronic anxiety or, or addiction or, or uh, anger issues. All of these things get in the way of our happiness and it's not simply a matter of relaxing. It's about having a fundamental change in the way we think. Fundamental change of our habits which don't just turn off with a switch. Happiness is something that we really have to work at. If we want it to be real and lasting and uh, true peace, and wisdom even more so, well, wisdom being the base of that of true peace. Freedom. <coughs> so by effort here, we don't mean working hard or pushing yourself hard. Effort, it means to extrapolate or to expand this concept of seeing things, seeing one thing clearly, to encompass everything, and to be about seeing everything clearly. So really getting into what I was talking about, about when you see or hear or think or feel anything, to see all of it clearly. 
So we give this basic exercise of watching your stomach rise and fall. And that's a simple beginner exercise. But to really put this practice into, uh, to put it in this technique into practice, uh, you have to, it has to include all aspects of our experience. So let's go through them together. We have first the body. This could be the movements of the body, starting with the rising and falling of the stomach, but if you scratch something, you can say scratching. Or if you bend your body, you can say bending. If you move your legs, moving. Just keep up with it and keep this, this uh, commentary going, reminding yourself, this is moving, this is lifting, this is scratching. Don't let your mind get, get away from you, so you start... You know, obsessing or reacting or, or going off on a tangent. Keep yourself present. The second is feeling. So if you have pain, you can stop focusing on the stomach for sure and focus on the pain instead. You can actually meditate on the pain. I once taught this to a, a, a cancer patient. She was at stage four cancer and I was teaching her about meditation and doing chanting and she found that she was unable to do it. She said, look, I have to take these pills. I have to take my pain medication. I said, well, put that aside for a second. Let's try this and try some meditation instead. I had her say to herself, pain, pain. And at first she couldn't do it. She was complaining, but I said, just try. We, we can always take the medication. Try this first. And she did it for a little, and then she fell asleep. She was able to experience the pain as just pain. But the problem is we, we cultivate these habits of aversion and every time we run away from a problem we, make, we become more averse to it. It becomes a really deeply ingrained habit such that we can't experience the smallest pain without getting upset. If you can see pain just as pain, it's no different from pleasure, it's just a feeling. And you find such peace, you can be at peace with yourself, even through the greatest pain. Of course, this takes effort, this takes work, to change your habit. Doesn't mean you're, immediate, you're suddenly not going to be upset at pain. But it cultivates a new habit of just seeing pain not as bad, but as pain. So we remind ourselves, pain, pain, pain. If you feel happy, do the same. Say to yourself, happy, happy. If you feel calm, say calm, calm. Because that's the other side of the coin, of course. If something makes you happy, then you become addicted. You get attached to it. And so we cultivate addictions to food or to entertainment or any number of things. And then that, our happiness becomes dependent on it, on uh, uh, material and, and specific experiences. And so we spend all our time seeking out certain experiences and not able to experience the full spectrum of, of experience. We put things in categories of good, bad, acceptable, unacceptable. We become vulnerable to change unable to accept when things don't go our way. So we try to be objective about even happiness, saying to ourselves, happy, happy, just experiencing it, not making it go away. Just like the pain, it's come, it came unwelcome, unbidden, and unbidden it will go. The third aspect is thoughts, and just the same, we'll say to ourselves, thinking, thinking, whether it's thoughts about the past or about the future. Good thoughts, bad thoughts, in the end they are all thoughts. In this moment you have a thought. And what do we do about them? Nothing. We don't have to do anything about them. They're not a problem. The problem is our reaction to them. As usual, we blow them out of proportion or we turn them into a problem. 
whether it's something going to happen in the future or something that's happened in the past, it's not here right now. All that's here is the thought. So the stress and the worry and the disappointment and the fear and the anger and the emotions that come from it, they're all just based on the thought. They come from nothing. When we say to ourselves, thinking, thinking, it's just a thought. It comes and it goes. We don't get lost in it, caught up in it, distracted by it. We're able to stay present. And the fourth aspect is our emotions. These are the ones that are intrinsically a problem, but as I said, they're only really a problem if they balloon out of control. Anger for a moment is just a moment of anger, that's all it is. But when you get angry, when you build it up and turn it into a, you make me so angry, that makes me so angry, I'm so angry, I, I, me, me, mine then it becomes a problem. Anxiety is not a problem. Fear is not a problem. Insomnia is not a problem. I used to have insomnia really bad. And uh, the funny thing about insomnia is the more you want to sleep, the harder it is to fall asleep. Right? But once you see it just as an experience, you know, oh, now I'm wanting to sleep, wanting, wanting, I'm anxious, anxious, anxious angry, frustrated. It's actually great not to sleep because you can stay up and meditate all night. And as soon as you lose that desire, you stop reacting to it, you stop build it, ballooning it out of control, it's actually very easy to fall asleep. Your body will do it by itself. Your mind will shut off, your body will shut down. It'll happen naturally, unless you're freaking out about it, right? Reacting and So you, you now have a broader picture. This is the idea of effort. The, the, uh, applying this idea of objectivity to your whole experience, to your whole self, every aspect of who we are. Whether it's a physical sensation, a feeling, a thought, or an emotion. And just spend a few minutes now, I can try to apply it.
So you should see fairly quickly that meditation is not something, this type of meditation or meditation on yourself is not a not an easy thing. It's not something you can just fall into. And as soon as you uh, l let go, loosen up, you know, s let your guard down, you find yourself slipping off into old habits, drifting off, or getting caught up in thoughts or emotions. If you're not constantly vigilant, it's very hard to maintain this sort of objective awareness. But you find that the rewards you should see after doing it just for a short time, that the rewards are quite impressive. You begin to have a clearer mind. If you work at it, if you put in the effort, your mind will be clear, you will be objective and equanimous, no longer chasing after or, or needing so much, clinging so much, judging so much. You'll be present. You'll find maybe for the first time that you're here and now. And you understand what they're talking about when they say, be here and now. We all think that we're sitting here and now, right? We are here, just sitting together in this room. When we think about the other people in this room, we just think, well, they're just sitting there doing very little. But if you knew what was going on in everyone's heads, it's actually a war going on in this room. Everyone's, well, unless you're all enlightened beings, I don't know, but ordinary people, when we begin to meditate, it's so many things. All of the baggage that we carry around, we start to see it. It starts to open up. And so when you learn to just be objective, to just experience, then you really come back to now. Then you really are just sitting here. This is the challenge that we, we put to ourselves. To begin to just be, to just live. To not be sitting here, but have our mind be a thousand miles away, thinking about something else, obsessing about it, stressing about it. To be present. Mm -hmm. To be at peace. So effort, this is our second theme. The third theme for today is really the next step. So, so far we've learned We've looked at ourselves, we've expanded the meditation to cover everything about ourselves, what could be next. The next step is our relationship with the world around us, starting with the six doors, the doors of perception, seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, feeling and thinking, but really expanding into the world, because these six doors are how we experience the world. Remember, we're, we're giving up the notion that there is a room here that we're sitting in. And we're, we're looking at, trying to look at the world from a point of view of our senses, of our experience. So the room that we're sitting in only comes into being in our, in our minds, when we see or hear or smell or taste or feel or think. With your eyes closed, you might hear, you'll hear me talking, and so that gives you the idea that I'm sitting over here, but it starts with the senses. 
And this is important because it means that all of our problems as well begin with the senses. If you have a problem with me, it's going to start with seeing me or hearing me or thinking about me well, through one or, other, or another of the senses. If you have a problem with this room, maybe it's too hot or too cold, that comes through the senses. All of our problems, if they don't come from one of the five senses, they come from the sixth sense, which is just the thoughts or the mind, thinking about them. So many of our problems just come from that one sixth sense. They don't have any basis in reality. They're cerebral or intellectual problems. But nonetheless, this is uh, the nature of reality. They come through the senses. And so, like the rest of our experience, if we can guard these senses, if we can act as a sort of a gatekeeper and fix ourselves rather than at the object of the sense, fix ourselves at this, the door of the sense itself, as I was saying, when someone's yelling at you, to just be able to say hearing, hearing. To know that you're hearing this person talking. And we wouldn't get upset or react to it. I mean, more to the point, if there's loud noise, so your neighbors blaring their music, right? And when we get angry and we feel self-righteous about how dare they make that loud noise. But all of it came just from hearing, and it was just simple sound. And we think, well, it's distracting me. I said, well, it's only distracting you because of your reaction to it. If you just experienced it as sound, why should it be any different from any other sound? It's only that we judge it as being an unpleasant sound, a harsh sound, an unwelcome sound. The people listening to their music actually think it's a pleasant sound. We get to the point where just hearing a person's voice upsets us. Maybe an in-law or a parent or a child. Just the sound of someone's voice triggers such a reaction. Because we cultivate the habit of aversion, of anger, of frustration. Right. And the same goes with addiction. We get to the point where we see delicious food, we haven't even tasted it yet, and our mouth waters. This is this operant conditioning or behavioral conditioning. We become conditioned and we just see something. Our mouth starts to water. When we think about a delicious meal, then we become obsessed with it. When we think about people or entertainment or this or that, we become become slaves no, to our desires. This is the problem that we find with commercialism, materialism. It becomes an obsession. It becomes a very difficult habit to break, to be content, to be at peace with what you have and to not need more and more and new and new. And the, the key here is the senses, that it all ends up just being a, an experience. When you see, it's just seeing. When you hear, it's just hearing. This is how the Buddha taught. This is really the core of the Buddha's teaching. He said, dite dita matang bhavisati. Let seeing just be seeing. Sutte sutta matang bhavisati. Let hearing just be hearing. Even thinking, vinyate vinyata matang bhavisati. Let thinking just be thinking. And so that's what we do. When you see something, we remind ourselves, seeing, seeing. Even with your eyes closed, maybe you see something that you want. or you'll see. Some people, when they meditate, they start to visualize things just un, un, uh, unintentionally. Or just uh, unintentionally, they, they, they begin to see you know, visions or so on. Or maybe if you've 
watched a lot of television, you'll have movies playing back. Or so. Or if you hear something, we're sitting and you hear the cars. Or I'm going to be teaching meditation at my university and I'm going to try to teach people uh, in the most busy part of the university because no one comes to meditate, so they're too busy. So I said, we'll have a five-minute meditation lesson right in the middle of the hallway, this busy corridor. They have these tables set up, so we're booking a table and we're going to teach meditation in the busy part. The, the, the concept being that you can meditate anywhere in any situation. You can meditate on the side of the road. You can meditate walking to work or bicycling or driving your car. You can meditate when you're washing dishes, when you're eating. You can do eating meditation, chewing, chewing, swallowing. You can do sleeping meditation when you lie down to sleep, everything. Don't leave anything out, eating, drinking, even in the texts it even talks about urinating and defecating as a meditation. And don't leave anything out. Showering, everything you do can be meditation. It means just being there, being present. It's remarkable, we don't, if you haven't done it, you don't know the feeling, but it, once you try it, it's remarkable how much energy you conserve just by being present, how, how refreshed you feel when you're not bogged down, weighed down by all these thoughts, doing one thing and thinking another, and your mind racing all the time. So the third theme is, third aspect of what leads to well-being is, is to be conscious at your senses and to be like a doorkeeper, letting in only the experience and not the reaction or the judgment. The fourth theme is letting go. You have to note that we put letting go at the end. And I think that's apt. I think that's a good thing. Because, well, we all hear about how important it is to let go. Why can't you just let go? And we put a lot of effort into forcing ourselves to let go, trying to. Isn't it funny when you put it that way? I find it amusing to point this out to people. You want to let go, do you? So you, you, you'd like to be able to control your ability to let go. You'd like to be able to force yourself to let go. Let go, damn it. <laughs> it's sort of like that. No? Someone tells you to let go and you try your hardest. <laughs> it's kind of ridiculous. But it's reasonable, it's understandable. If you, if you don't, we don't come into the world knowing how to do such things. We start off with a pretty strong inclination to cling, right? And our parents reinforce this with their toys and their amusements, anything to get us to stop crying. And it starts off really on the wrong foot. It's all about appeasing our desires rather than letting them go. You don't have parents saying, oh, let them cry, you know, they'll let go of it. They'll learn to let go eventually. It doesn't really work that way. We're not equipped to let go. So by this you can understand that I'm going to claim that letting go is something that you don't do, it's something that comes to you through the meditation. Letting go is something that comes, we would claim, through
through wisdom, through understanding. I mean, this is clear in many cases. And when you realize you're holding on to something hot, you drop it. You don't have to think about it. If you don't realize you're, what you're holding on to is hot, you, you'll never let it go. We do this with many of our habits. We hold on to things not realizing that they're causing us suffering, really, literally, just not realizing it. We're blind. We don't realize that we're blind. We get very, very angry, and we're just not mindful enough to see what we're doing to ourselves. You're getting angry isn't hurting me. It's hurting you. Or we cling to things, we obsess, we, this is how, how drug addicts, how blind they are. Of course they can say, yeah, I know what I'm doing, but they don't really. They're not mindful when they're engaging. They lose their mindfulness completely. And they turn into animals. We mostly do. And Try and sit down and be mindful when you're eating. If you've never done it before, you, you'll be shocked at how much of an animal we are when we eat. We just chow down for the most part. Lose our sense of self completely, our, our presence, our awareness. And then the food's gone all of a sudden and we don't know what happened. We get caught up in the tastes and the, the, the desire for it. Food is an interesting thing because we think of how delicious food is, but the, the delicious taste only lasts for a moment. And if you have the same taste repeatedly, it becomes actually quite unpleasant. If you keep the same food in your mouth for, say, 30 seconds, you won't want, you'll be very quick to swallow it. And you start to see that actually this is, it's quite interesting that as soon as the food starts to feel mushy and disgusting, we, we're very quick to swallow it. There's much more going on than we see, than we, than we realize. People do, who do long-term meditation courses, it's quite interesting. They become fed up with eating after some time. And they wake up in the morning and hear the, din the dinner bell, the lunch bell. And they say, oh, if only I didn't have to go for food. They start to see it as a bit of a chore. Right? Maybe it sounds kind of horrifying to think of if you're used to the idea that food leads to happiness or so on. But such people are actually quite, quite at peace with themselves, quite happy, because their happiness doesn't depend on anything. This is really the key. If you want to be truly happy, your happiness can't depend on something that's impermanent. There's nothing in the world that could satisfy us, because there's nothing in the world that is, sad, that is permanent, that is lasting. This is why we, 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 yeah, we stress, we feel such, we grieve so terribly when we lose things. And because of the nature of these things, they can't satisfy us. All they can do is build up attachment to them that can never be fulfilled. Attachment doesn't lead to satisfaction, it leads to more attachment. This is how the addiction cycle works. Even in the brain, they can, there, there's descriptions of it. Any pleasure that you get from any stimulus uh, becomes insufficient the next time around. You need more of the same stimulus to bring the same pleasure. That's how the brain works. It's even, we're even wired that way. So the claim or the, the conclusion that we come to is happiness has to be uh, irrespective of our experience. We have to be happy with or without. We have to be happy. Your happiness can't depend on this or that experience because you're vulnerable. You, your happiness becomes a crap shot. It's, it's a gamble. Some people live their whole lives happy. And then they think, well, that's all. You just have to go for what you like. But then they ignore the millions of people around the world who are 
in horrible states who have no such luxury. They can't just, oh, well, think positively. Not when you're in a war zone, not really. You, know, you can't get what you want. If your happiness depends on getting what you want, you get in trouble. We get old, we get sick, in the end we die. It's not dreary, it's actually quite liberating. When you say, okay, there's another way. My happiness doesn't have to depend on things. There's two, so there's two kinds of happiness. We call niramissa sukha. Amisa sukha means happiness that takes an object, requires something. Niramisa sukha is happiness that doesn't require something. It comes from within, it comes from this, this uh, presence, just being here, just sitting, of letting go. So this, this, we may take this as a theme, and it, I said that it's not something that you can do, but it is something you can resolve yourself upon. Because if you're intent on clinging, that view, that concept, that, that belief that clinging is somehow to your benefit is always going to hold you down. A bird can't fly if it clings to the tree. We're like these beasts clinging to the side of a cliff looking down and seeing how far it is and afraid that if we let go we're going to fly and we're going to fall and so we cling to this we cling to everything we cling to our possessions we cling to people we cling to health and youth and life and all the time it's crumbling out from underneath us and in the end we lose it all in the end we get old we get sick we die comes to everyone this is, we know this, this is not. But we, yet we cling, we cling, and because what's the alternative? The alternative is to fall, we think. But it turns out that we're birds, that we can fly. It turns out that the universe doesn't work that way. It turns out that when we let go, then we realize we were just being held down. I mean, this sounds, you know, the imagery is nice, I suppose, but you may still be skeptical and think, well, that's not really, if I let go of everything, what would happen? If I let go of my job and so on. But it's not really like that. Remember, we're talking about the basics of experience. A person who lets go, they become compassionate, they become caring, they become uh, non-judgmental of others, and they become free of all their own baggage and needs and desires and wants, obsessions and, and you know, uh, men, neuro, neuro, neuroses. And, and so, absolutely their lives improve a thousandfold. People start to appreciate them, trust them, like them, look up to them, to think that your life could be weighed down or, or, or it would be a fall to let go is ridiculous. It's, it's wrong thinking. It's how most of us think, but it's wrong-headed. When you let go, you rise up. In Buddhism, this is considered the path to heaven. That's why you know, the idea of heaven being a bright and light and place up in, up in the sky or so on kind of apt because it comes from letting go, from, from, from you know, dropping all your baggage, rising up, becoming lighter. It's another meaning of the word enlightenment, to, to let go of everything that weighs you down. It doesn't mean to become uh, flippant or lackadaisical or so on. It's not like that, because as much as we might say lazy people are, are not concerned with anything, they are actually quite a bit concerned. If you ever told a lazy person to get up and do work, or to, to try and even practice something like uh, clear awareness, they would get angry and upset. You'd find that they're very much attached to a specific state, and if that state is threatened, they will be... Lazy people will get quite active in their aversion towards it.
True letting go is actually takes a lot of effort. Not at letting go, but at seeing clearly. At living in a life that is balanced and objective and peaceful and content and mindful. So that's our fourth meditation, to remind ourselves of the benefits of letting go and to practice with that in, in mind, to let ourselves be objective, to let ourselves be happy with or without, to not react to positive experiences or negative experiences. To not see them as positive, whether it's pain or whether it's pleasure, to just see it as an experience. So by this time you should find that it's probably getting difficult to sit still. Most of you, most of us probably have pain in the body from sitting still. Or you'll have anxiety or, or, or emotions building up, it starts to get difficult and You'll see these coming through the mind. So you just look at them, and the, as, as this in this theme of letting go, and put them in your sights, and make a determination that this is the problem. These reactions, not the sitting still, is not a problem. Not the problem. See these this negativity, this reactionary attitudes. No? likes and dislikes, aversions and addictions. And make a determination to, to learn to let go, to live your life now, to be present in your life in everything you do. So, that's all I have to say. If anyone has any questions or wants to argue about what I said, now would be the time, or we can, uh, if there's not, and well, there isn't, let's just, we can just stay sitting. You know? Keep meditating if you like. But I'm open to taking questions. I'd like to thank everyone for coming. It's, it's great to have a group and thank Caroline, Courtney, shoot, Courtney for inviting us, mm -hmm. inviting me, having us. Okay. Courtney, bad with names. Can you touch on forgiveness to yourself? Me? It's interesting, I've had this question before. You don't really forgive yourself. It's not really the same. Um, and you regret this is Yeah. Things that you've done, but you can't change them. See, forgiving yourself is more about the, uh, the need to be perfect, you know? It's a bit different because it's about ego. We have this self-esteem and uh, you know, the, the self-hatred. I mean, I guess it can come from different, different sources, but in general it's uh, not being good enough, you know, and uh, needing yourself to be something or, or clinging to the idea of self, like I did this bad thing, you know. It's, an, it's another one of those concepts when the reality behind it is, is anger, you know. Mm -hmm. When you don't forgive yourself, it's, it's about being angry at yourself, about hating something. Right. Or it's about uh, low self-esteem because you feel like, I'm not good enough, or I'm not. Uh, this. But that's a mo it's it's a state, you know. When you have that emotion, you feel that anger, or the, the frustration, or the guilt, or the sadness, when you feel that I'm not good enough. Uh, focus on that. See, the idea of forgiving yourself is 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 it's just a cerebral thing where you say I forgive myself, but stop being angry at yourself or sad about yourself, or whoever it is. So look at that emotion and let it go. So, because my perspective of it, 
is that I knew I was a lot smarter, but I let impulse and I got wrapped up into something. Yeah. And then I'm kind of got a clear slate from the outcome. So that, I guess that's more. So is that ego when you're when you knew you were smarter, but you were just blind to the and just forgive yourself? Go well. Sometimes you get caught up in stuff and you're blind. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's more about looking at... See, when you say just forgive yourself, you're brushing aside the... You're not, you're not, uh, you're not taking seriously the emotion. Mm -hmm. So what is it you're forgiving? The, what is it that the forgiveness is supposed to address? The original feeling of guilt or anger or sadness or however it appears to you. And that's more important. That's more real. So when you say, oh, just forgive yourself, you're kind of brushing over the, yeah. the problem. Like, um, like, well, take how we forgive someone else. If, if someone hurts you, you're very angry at them. So one theory is, well, you should learn to forgive them. But that's kind of brushing over, or not, you know, not... Um, inval it's like invalidating the feeling of the anger. And you have to say, well, why am I getting angry? Much more, much more important is to learn about the anger. To say, and, and say, is this anger useful? Oh, no. Getting angry at this person isn't helping. So forgiveness, not, not really the, it doesn't get to the root, you see. Mm -hmm. What's really going on is you're angry. You know, look at the anger. Angry, angry. And you see, oh, yeah, anger's not useful. You'll see, you'll, you'll see viscerally that anger isn't helping me with my situation. It makes it really easy to forgive, I guess is what I would say. Once you do that, you don't not angry, so there's, it's very easy to say, look, I forgive you, I have no hard feelings. I, I wish you well. And it's easy to have compassion, we would say, for the other person and love for the other person. Forgiveness, I think, a little bit indirect. How was the pain? Were you able to meditate on it? Mm -hmm. oh. it's, a, it's a toss up. If you have a sense that set, staying in certain positions is going later to lead to more pain, it doesn't make sense. You want to honor what the body needs if you learn that, on the other hand. Looking at the pain is always interesting, and it's just pain. Uh, but why add more? So it's it's. Well, it's not exactly that. It's that every time you run away from the pain, it it, it cultivates your habit of aversion. It makes you dislike it more. It, it increases the aversion to the pain. So staying with the pain decreases your aversion, and then. Eventually, no matter how much pain comes, it's not a problem. And in fact, part of that is because aversion also affects the body. It makes you sick. When you tense up because of the pain, it, it, it actually hurts your body further. And so you'll find that eventually the pain will, much of the pain will subside because some of it is being caused by the mind. Yeah. For the Except it wouldn't be because of the pain, it would be because of a, an injury, you know. This is going to injure me if I do this. It's going to make, it's going to hurt my body. Yeah. You know? So if you can separate the pain out from the injury, for sure. But you know, much of pain is just pain. It's not, uh, and the body likes to complain. Arthritis, for example. Take someone who has arthritis. You know, bearing with the pain doesn't create worse arthritis. No, but sitting long when you get stiff, when, you're, when you have arthritis and that leads to more stiffness, 
why, why do that when you can do a walking meditation? So, you know, it's just sure. how you take care of it. Why not do it? The only reason would be because you don't like the pain. And that aversion is a problem. And, and there's more to it, as I'm saying, I guarantee that for, for much of it, you, you, you get an improvement when you sit through it. It's, the Buddha called it the worst type of austerity, patience. Patience is the hardest form of torture, the worst form of torture. No, he said the best form of torture, actually. So in, in India, you know the story of the Buddha, how he was torturing himself and people in India were all torturing themselves. So after he became enlightened, he said, Kanti paramang bodhitika. Patience is the highest paramang, the highest form of torture. I just encourage you to give it a try. Try it from time to time and, or look at it. You, know, you seem comfortable with your way, but just a, a suggestion, Sorry. another option. Mm -hmm. Comfortable would not be the word I would choose. But yeah. Could you say a little more about patience is the best form of torture? Um, well, it's torture, you know, to sit through something. <laughs> <laughs> ah, because he, I mean, he really decided that torturing your body was not the way to enlighten, yeah. isn't that? Yeah, so he came up with a new form of torture that was actually useful. It's, and it's important to make the distinction, because when you don't, then you think, well, sitting through pain is a form of torture. Well, sitting and torturing yeah, That's not what he, he meant. When you torture yourself and think, this pain is going to uh, do something for me, because what they, it was, tapas actually means, it's like temperature, it's the same root word. Tapas means heat. So the concept was if you torture yourself, the pain and the suffering burns up bad karma. I see. By, by purposefully subjecting yourself to pain, you, you burn up your bad karma. Because you say, well, I've done bad things, I deserve pain. So it's like in the West when we hit ourselves and say, oh, I'm such a bad person. Or when we uh, you know, don't forgive ourselves for bad things, we beat ourselves up, as we say. And so we think, I deserve this. It's kind of the same. They took it to an extreme and they said, well, yeah, I really deserve this. Let's you know, hurt myself. And that'll be a good, that's a good spiritual practice. People looked at it and said, wow, yeah, that's kind of noble what these guys are doing. So the Buddha tried it, the Bodhisattva tried it, and in the end he said it's actually kind of useless, beating yourself up over stuff. But sitting through the karma that you do have to pay, you see, is actually quite useful. So patience. But how do you be patient is the question. It's not just by sitting through it and ah, moaning and wailing. It's, you have to be objective. You have to... And it goes with other things as well. Patience is two-sided. Patience means patience with good things. I want a cheesecake. Mm, wanting, to, to say to yourself, wanting, wanting, and not go for the cheesecake, that's also patience. I mean, you could take it for drugs if someone is a drug addict or so, and if they're able to just experience, stay smoking. Many meditators are able to free themselves from smoking because they're patient with it. When the wanting comes, okay, I want it. There's no, connect, there's no logical connection between wanting and taking. Wanting doesn't make it right to take, but that's how we think. In the way, you know, we think, well, yeah, if you want it, that means you should take it. There's no logical reason. And so if you're patient with it, you say, oh, wanting comes, wanting goes, and I'm happy without it. Much happier, actually. I can't believe I forgot your name. <laughs> Funny. Forgetting names, forgetting names, yeah. forgetting names. <laughs> it shows non-self. We have this concept of you know, experience coming by itself. Memory, we always say, oh, yeah, it's our excuse. Yeah, memory, it's impermanent. It's not self. You can't control your memory.
Okay, well, maybe we'll finish there then. No? If you if you want to talk, I'm here. I have some booklets if you're interested in this type of meditation. I've got booklets on how to meditate. I've got a couple of DVDs for kids if you have any kids who'd like to learn how to meditate. Otherwise, thank you all for coming. I wish you all a happy new year. Sorry? For you, for you, for you, for you. Today? Tomorrow? In the coming days. I mean, you don't live here, so you're obviously not going to stay here. You're right. Well take you somewhere. I'm going back to Canada on the 29th. I live in Ontario. Yeah, go ahead.